Hello to all logging on. We will begin in just a moment. All right, good afternoon and welcome to our MPF webinar, Exploring Moss Diversity with Lori Hetrick Boldenberg. My name is Amanda Lance Ramrap, Events and Communications Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation and Grow Native Program. I wanna thank you all for joining us for today's webinar as we dive into the dazzling diverse world of mosses. When you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A section on your Zoom screen. At the end of Lori's presentation, MPF Conservation Program Associate Lily Germeroth will facilitate a brief Q&A session by reading your submitted questions aloud. As always, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and all other resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session will be shared with all of you in an email tomorrow. Now, perhaps you've encountered Lori's work before as she is both a scientist and a published children's author. Lori received a BS in animal science at the University of Illinois, then worked as a senior genetic research specialist at the Sequencing and Genotyping Laboratory Unit of the University of Illinois for 15 years. After moving to Missouri in 2015, she started working as a natural resource specialist for Missouri State Parks, where she developed a great passion for biophytes, which encompass mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. She published a paper in 2021, Biophytes of Graham Cave State Park, and is currently working on a field identification guide for the mosses of Missouri. Lori has also published a children's book, Grimilda the Grasshopper, the story of how the lichen grasshopper came to be, which pairs a whimsical story with fun educational materials to teach children about insects from two ecosystems in Missouri, tall grass prairies and glades. Lori, I know you have so much in store for us today, so without further delay, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. I will get my screen up here. All right, great, Lori, and you'll just turn on your camera whenever you're ready. Uh oh. Okay, is the camera on? Yep, we're great. Thank you. All right. Get on the big screen here. There we go. All right. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you everybody for coming to my program today. I am very excited to share with you uh, the diversity that can be found in the amazing little world of mosses. And it was actually very hard for me to pick out what things to highlight today in such a short time frame. But hopefully after this program, you'll be able to walk away, go on a hike and maybe point out a few little green things that you didn't realize were moss and say, hey, that's a moss. So that's my goal for today. So just as a uh, quick reminder, as far as what separates mosses uh, from the vascular plant world, mosses in general lack tr true roots, but they do have what are called rhizoids and they're just little single um, cell width uh, pieces of their plant that their primary job is to anchor the moss to whatever substrate it's growing on. Additionally, mosses do not have flowers, uh, nor do they, do, do they produce seeds, but they produce, uh, reproduce sexually via spores. Mosses have a dominant gametophyte stage of life, and today I'm not going to go into the reproductive cycle of moss because it is a little bit weird and complex compared to what you're probably used to. But if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to go on Google, type in mosses, reproductive cycle, and you will get a plethora of sites that will have diagrams and descriptions, and you can take your time uh, working through that cycle. Because like I said, it's, it's quite different than what we're used to. Let's see, additionally, mosses do not have lignin, and so that kind of inhibits them from being able to become big like our trees because they just don't have the cellular strength to hold that weight. And additionally, last but not least, 
Uh, mosses lack what I call an advanced vascular system. So you've probably heard that mosses are avascular, and that's true to a certain level, but we do have species that have what we call an archaic vascular system. So again, lacking the lignum, it's not as sophisticated as what you'll find in trees and wildflowers, but some of our species do have an archaic vascular system. So I'm going to keep the terminology as minimal as I can. However, there are some words you are going to have to learn if you decide you want to do a little bit more exploring into the moss world and perhaps get a field guide or something of that nature. So the first two words I'm going to introduce to you are sporophyte and gametophyte. And we'll start off with gametophyte. And the gametophyte consists of the rhizoids, the stem, and the leaves. Additionally, the spores. The spores are actually the beginning part of the gametophyte. When the spore lands, it produces the entire structure uh, of the stem and the leaves. And that is, if any of you are familiar with the chromosome counts and things of that nature, nature, that is haploid. Again, I'm not going to go into the reproduction part, but for those who are familiar with that, those are haploid. So the gametophyte is what you are going to see all the time in the moss world. The sporophytes, the top half of that photo, um, are consist, they're comprised of the seta, which is that stalk that you see, along with the capsule at the top. The sporophyte is a result of successful fertilization between a sperm and an egg of the gametophyte. So that's actually the offspring of that green mass below it. And the sporophyte is consistently parasitic upon its parental gametophyte until death. So imagine if your kids were parasitic upon you your entire life. Yeah, no, we'll not go there, but the sporophytes are. And sporophytes have two copies of the chromosomes, but their main goal in life is to produce the spores. So those are the two terms, sporophytes and gametophytes. So we will uh, look at the diversity and characteristics of the gametophytes first. And the picture on the right is showing you Anamodon tristis, which now goes by Haplohymenium tristae. Uh, there's a lot of taxonomic changes, nomenclatural changes in the in the moss world. It's keeping us on our toes and a little bit crazy, but uh, that is the way things go. So the mass that you see, that's all gametophytes, that's all stems, that's all leaves. And in fact, in this species, you are likely to never encounter a sporophyte in North America because sporophytes are not known. So this species in North America reproduces vegetatively. In essence, the leaf tips will break off and go somewhere else and start a new life. Mosses come in different sizes. Uh, the polytrichum species you see on the left, when I measured that stem, it was a little bit over 15 centimeters in length. And some of those species will get to be up to 25 centimeters tall. And those are the species where that archaic vascular system comes into play because that's very helpful in moving nutrients and water up and down that very long stem. And on the opposite side of the spectrum is a tiny, tiny moss that I was introduced to this fall, Thysidens clusteri. In fact, the only reason you notice this moss is because if you see the sporophyte, which is basically what you see there, that stalk in that capsule, and that's no more than two millimeters tall on average. And that's my finger that you see on top with all of my fingerprints. So it's a small species. You can't even really see the gametophyte, which would be the leaves and the stems, even with a good hand lens, they're so small. The leaves are usually about 0.75 millimeters in length, and there may be one or two sets to it. So we can have extremely, extremely small plants out there as well. So when a spore lands on the ground, uh, the first thing it's going to do is send out these thread-like tendrils, and it's called protonema. Most of the time, the protonema will eventually form the gametophyte. And when that happens, when that's formed, so when that stem and those leaves form, uh, the protonema die. They've, they've done their job and they're no longer there. But we do have some species where the protonema stays around and it looks like this algal mat covering the soil or whatever it's on. In fact, most of the time, if you see it, you probably just think it's algae and don't realize it may actually be a moss that you're looking at. 
The picture on the right is zoomed in a little bit more and you'll probably see some round brown capsules. Those are the capsules and the leaves are these skinny kind of lighter green colored spiky looking things around it. So the gametophyte is actually very small in the species too. So most of what you see there is that protonemal mat. So those are always fun to come across. Now we'll talk about stems. Um, stems can be single, uh, they can be erect. The picture on the left is showing a dendroid type stature of a plant. So the main stem is kind of like a stipe and then you get all these branching uh, pieces coming off the top. And this is Chlamacium americanum. This is a very uh, obvious moss to see out in the field. When you see it, this is what it is. We really don't have any other species in Missouri that look like it. It's just wonderful to come across. People are always shocked when I say that's actually a moss. They're like, no, it's not, it's a small tree. No, it's a moss. But our stems can be branched, uh, they can be irregularly branched, or they can be regularly branched. So we'll have one to three pinnate species out there. The picture on the right, if you look at the stem on the right, that is showing you Haplocladium microphyllum. That's just a one pinnate uh, species plant. The rest of the stems to the left are all showing you Thuidium delicatulum, which goes by the common name delicate fern moss. And I think you can see why it resembles a fern with those two to three pinnate branchings going on. Most of the time our stems are green, but we do have quite a few species that have red stems and they're always beautiful to come across in the field. Just adds a little bit of difference in character things going on. Uh, this picture is showing Pleurosium shriberi. So red stems are a possibility in the moss world. Our stems can sometimes be covered with what we call paraphylia. And those um, pieces of vegetative material actually have a chlorophyll in the cells. So they do help in, in photosynthesis and they can come in different styles and shapes, but the fun ones are what that inset picture is showing you. It's that spindly, crazy looking thing and it coats the stems and it makes it look kind of fuzzy. And you can actually see this in the field if your eyesight is good up close, mine is not, I need readers, but even with a hand lens, you'll definitely be able to see that. And these can be helpful in identifying genera of, of what you may be looking at. On stems, we can also have what's called tomentum. Tomentum are actually rhizoids, if you remember those roots that are typically found near the base of the plant that help anchor it to the substrate. But sometimes the, the rhizoids go crazy and there's a lot of them and they'll creep up the, set, the stems to some very varying level. And when that happens, we call it tomentum. So the picture on the left is of Tychostomum pseudotriquetrum, and it's just showing you a plant where the, the tomentum is red, and it's kind of relegated to the lower half of the stem. And then the center picture is Alicomnium palustrae, and it also has red tomentum, and it pretty much goes up the entire length of the stem. And then my favorite is the picture on the right, that's Dicranum polycetum, that's actually an S1 ranked species species here in Missouri, uh, that's only because we're kind of at the edge of its range. But if you go a few states north up to Wisconsin, this, this species grows like a weed up there. And this takes the cake for tomentum. I mean, that is impressive. It looks like spittlebugs gone wild or somebody had, had fun with a whipped cream spray can. I don't know. But uh, that's all tomentum. And it's just quite impressive. All right, moving on to leaves. So just in general, we all know that moss leaves are pretty much one cell thick. They acquire all their nutrients uh, through osmosis, through the cells. Uh, but we do have species that have two cells or three cells thick leaves. And I am going to put in here some microscope photographs here and there because that's kind of my carrot that I'm hoping to dangle out to some of you to take moss a little bit further because a lot of the fascinating characteristics about mosses are only seen underneath the microscope. So I'm hoping to entice some of you to take it further. But the picture on the left is showing a leaf of a Schistidium species, uh, and it's actually mixed. So the lighter cells are actually only one cell thick, but then the darker streaks or bands that you see, those are two cell thick. And then the picture on the right is a cross section, and you can 
clearly see within reason that uh, where it's one cell thick or two cells thick. So leaf thickness can vary a little bit within our moth species. And here's a carrot I'm dangling out for you for microscope work. Uh, this is Leucobrium glaucum. And it actually has two different types of cells in its leaves. It has these great big white cells that are clear cells, I should say, that are called halocysts and they store water. Sphagnum mosses, you've probably heard of, uh, they're notorious for being able to store tons and tons of water. So they have a lot of these halocyst cells. And then the chlorocyst cells are those little green diamonds in the middle of it. But these leaves can be several cells thick. Uh, they're really good at resisting desiccation. Um, so they're good at storing water and uh, they're just a fun moss to find. I'm going to talk briefly about leaf arrangement only because if you do pick up a field guide, you are probably going to be asked at some point in time, are the leaves spirally arranged around the stem or are they distichous or two ranked is another term for the same thing. So if you look at a moss stem from the end down it, spirally ranked is kind of like how it sounds. The leaves just spiral around the stem. So you see leaves coming off that stem in all directions. Whereas with the distichous or two ranked, and you look down the stem, the leaves are only coming off on two points of the stems. And we do have a few genera that have that characteristic and fissidens is one of them. So talking about leaves, you can pretty much find any shape of leaf in the moss world, except for leaves that are um, di dissected or bisected. So think of a silver maple leaf, for example. We won't have that level of dissected leaves in the moss world that, I, that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, so these are just some examples to throw out at you. Uh, the fissidens is on the left. Fissidens are often called pocket mosses because that darker area, area that you see in the top half of the leaf is actually a second leaf blade on there and it forms a pocket. Um, the middle picture is Plagiomnium ellipticum and the characteristic that I wanna point out to you here is if you look at those leaves, it looks like you're looking at, say, a mesh screen on a window. And what a term that is used to describe this is open areolation of the cells. And that is because you're actually seeing the cells, they're big. So it forms this open areolation look to it. And so that's what's meant by that term. The picture on the right is Campylopus toluensis, and that's just showing you some long, beautiful, slender, leaves that we can have in the moss world. And we have curly. Oh my gosh, do we have curly? Sadly, though, you won't find the species in Missouri, but I had to put it in here because how can I not? I mean, that's just glorious. I don't know any other way to look at it besides just beautiful. But don't worry, we do have a uh, curly leaved species here in Missouri. This is a picture of a hypnum species. Hypnum is most of our species are now over underneath another genera somewhere. Uh, but a common name for these mosses are brocade mosses because those curved leaves are just very uniform and they form a brocade look. So that's a common name uh, given to uh, this genera. Fall Kate and Sakoon. Those are some more terms that you'll come across in the moss world. Fall Kate is just referring to a curved leaf. Sakooned means that the leaves are all going in the same direction. So the pictures that I have here are showing you the moss Dicranum scoparium, which is a very common moss in Missouri. And you may say, oh my gosh, that looks like there's wind blowing through that moss species. And in fact, the common name for this species is windswept moss. But I guarantee you, not a drop of wind was blowing that day. That's just how those leaves grow. They're secund. They are all growing in one direction. So moss have a... Uh, center mid vein thing going down the center that could be uh, equated to a mid vein in a tree leaf or a flower leaf. And in the moss world, we call it a costa. 
Some moss species have costas, some do not have costas. And so oftentimes you'll be asked, do you have a costa or not? So on and so forth. So the picture on the left is showing you a species that does not have a costa. Uh, most of our plants out in the field with a good hand lens, you can get a pretty good idea if it has a costa or doesn't have a costa. And in some cases, it'll have a double costa. Uh, the picture in the middle is showing a single costa that goes down the center of the leaf. Sometimes it'll be short, sometimes it'll be long, and sometimes those costas will even go past the leaf tip and form like a, an on or a, an apiculation at the tip of the leaf. Then the picture on the right is of Rytidia delphis triquetris. I don't have a good microscope picture of it, so that's a drawing I've done. And it's just showing you that double costa, and they can be short or they can be long. But these are the, the general costa styles that you will find in the moss world. And the costa is helpful sometimes in transporting nutrients, but also giving structure to the leaf. And speaking of costa, sometimes we'll have what are called lamellar strips running down the center of it. This photo is of a Trichum crispulum. This is an S2 ranked species in Missouri and they're fun leaves to see. They're kind of undulate and wavy and all sorts of fun going on here. The picture on the left is a cross section of that leaf. And so what you are looking at there, that center round oval shape, that's the costa. And then the long strips going off to the left and to the right, those are the leaf blades. But then those short little stumps on the top of the costa, those would be the lamellar strips. And in this case, it looks like there's six of them and they're anywhere from two to three cells tall. And how tall and the number of cells uh, you find or how many strips you find, that can help you determine what species you are looking at. So sometimes in the moss world, more often than not, you actually need to, to look at features underneath the microscope. And sometimes you have to do cross sections. You get to find out how good you are with a razor blade. It's lots of fun. Sometimes those lamellar strips are just crammed tight on the leaf blade and actually fill up the entire leaf blade. And that's the case of our polytrichum species that we find here. You really can't tell that those are strips out in the field. Just again, they're so tightly compact but the, the leaves do look thick and fleshy and that's just because it has all of those strips running down the entire leaf blade it just fills up the leaf blade and then we have leaves that have cilia on them and this is stelia asperella i always love coming across this out in the field one, it just has that beautiful gray, blue, green color to it. And then in the right light, the sun will pick up all those cilia and the, and the, and the proliferous tip at the end. And it's just a beautiful moss to see. And you'll probably also notice that it looks like it has these dark spots all over those cells. And those are papillae. Papillae is another fascinating thing to see underneath the microscope because we have all sorts of, of kinds of papillae in the moss world. They can be hooked, they can be branched, they can be simple, they can be small, they can, they can be multiple, meaning you have more than one on a cell or singular, or sometimes they're hollow, so they look C-shaped. So all sorts of fun, uh, crazy things that you'll find in the papillose world of bryophytes. And of course, we'll have serrations of all different types and levels. Uh, the picture on the left is showing you Plagionium ciliare. Its common name is saber-toothed thyme moss. And I think you can see why, because those teeth are pretty sharp. They're about three to four cells long. If you look at them underneath a the microscope, they're very obvious, very evident, and they go around the entire edge of the leaf. We'll also have mosses where the edges of the leaves will roll up and on top of the leaf blade that's called enrolled. And that's very characteristic of Wysia controversa, which you see on the right. Uh, we also will have species where they're revolute, meaning they roll underneath the leaf. Those can be a bit challenging to decipher in the field, but just again, just showing, telling you about different variations that we can have uh, in our leaf structures in mosses. Okay, asexual propagation, oh boy. Yeah, it's crazy in the moss world. It was really challenging to pick just three species to portray because there's a lot out there and they're just beautiful in their own rights and they're a lot of fun. So this is again, a way that the moss can reproduce. It's not sexual, it's asexual. It's just vegetative pieces. 
Typically, we call those propagules or gamma. Those are two terms you will hear applied to these features. So the picture on the left is Serhopodon texanus, and it'll just form these stellate masses at the tip of modified leaves. It's just, it's fun. And then the middle one is Polia anatina. That's a little bit hard to decipher in the photograph. It'll form these long kind of fusiform uh, pieces that are a little bit twisted. If you do look at them underneath the microscope, they come out of the axles of the leaves and are usually towards the top half of the stems. And then the picture on the right is Centricia papillosa. And those are not spores. Those are actual propagules or gamma and they're round shaped and they are typically found along the top side of the costa of the leaf. So all sorts of fun things can be found out there in the form of propagules. Leaves can look very different from dry to wet. I'm often asked, when's the best time to go look for mosses? And of course, it's always beautiful after a rain because they're just lush and green and full. But sometimes it's helpful to be able to see them in their dry state because certain characteristics might be able to help you uh, pare down a possibility to, to a genus, perhaps. So the picture on the left is the trichum angustatum. And the lower corner, you'll see the leaves are all extremely cur curled up, and we call that contorted. And so that's what happens with those leaves when they're dry. They can also change color. So the picture on the right is Centricia royalis. When it's dry, the leaves are basically almost black. And honestly, with those silver tips, I think it's just as beautiful dry as it is wet. But when it is wet, you get to see its color. And I took this picture in winter, so it's displaying its winter colors, which is uh, resultant in that those yellows and the oranges. But if I took that picture in summer, they would be green. So speaking of color changes, we do get color changes in the moss world. Usually it's due to uh, the environment. So whether it's changes of the season or something happened in the, the direct environment around it, like some trees came down and it's been exposed to, to more sunlight than it's used to, but we will get color changes. And this is a sphagnum species uh, that is showing its typical green color and then uh, its red color later in the year. Another piece of candy to drop on you for a microscope. Uh, this is a very diagnostic character for Imnium stellare. When those cells die, they release a blue pigment that is just drop dead gorgeous. And yeah, it saddens me that the cells are dying, but it really is just quite beautiful. One uh, last thing to share with you about uh, the gametophytes. Uh, just like the vascular plant world, we do have monoecious and dioecious species. And someday, if you haven't already, you've probably come across or will come across uh, this out in the field. And you're probably saying, hey, those are flowers. But I thought Lori said moss don't have flowers. Well, these are not flowers. These are modified leaves on male gametophytes. Uh, this happens to be polytrichum um, juniperinum. And these modified leaves form what we call a splash cup. And their job is to help in the dispersal of sperm. And so sperm are motile, but only in water. So when a raindrop comes down, it collects the sperm, but then the shape of the cup causes that raindrop to go flying further away. So they're able to fertilize uh, uh, female gametophytes further away from them than if they just relied purely on the rain uh, dra draping down over themselves. So sometimes they're red, sometimes they're yellow. It depends on the species. I'm not sure why it's colored, but uh, someday maybe I will find out. Okay, so now we'll move on to uh, diversity of characteristics in the sporophytes. And the two uh, main terms that you'll really need to know for this would be the seta, which you've heard me say, that's the stalk that is holding the capsule at the end. The other term is calyptra, and the calyptra is just a covering over the capsule while it is maturing. So it's protecting that capsule while it matures and eventually it falls off. Don't worry about the other two terms. I just didn't change my slide on that part of it, but seta, capsule, and then calyptra. All right. My last two terms, I promise, uh, that is acrocarp and pleurocarp. You will be hard pressed to find a set of keys that do not ultimately ask you if what you are looking at is an acrocarp or a pleurocarp. 
really all this is asking you is where is that sporophyte located on its parental plant on the gametophyte? So if the sporophyte is at the end of the stem or the branches, it's a it's an acrocarp. If it looks like the sporophyte is coming off the side of the stems, it is a pleurocarp. If you don't have any sporophytes to help you, sometimes just the overall look of the plant can give you an idea of what you're looking at. Acrocarps tend to be upright with a little bit of branching, if at all. And then the pleurocarps tend to be sprawling across a substrate and highly branched. So those are just some pretty loose um, overall features of those two terms without sporophytes. I love this picture. This is my Tortella humilis sporophyte spastic ball. Um, this is just showing you that capsules can be what we call exerted. So capsules typically are either exerted or immersed on the plant. And basically what that is asking you is the capsule past the tip of the leaf or is it beneath the tip of the leaf? So in this case, it is clearly way past the tip of the leaf. And so this, the setas can be really long. Some setas can reach up to five centimeters in length, depending on the species. So then the opposite is the immersed capsules. And there is a seta there, you just don't see it because it's extre extremely small. But this shows you that the capsules are not past the tip of the leaf, so they are immersed. Uh, the picture on the left is Diphyscium foliosum, and this is a blast to see out in the field. Uh, you'll probably only notice it when it has those capsules. They're so distinct. They're shaped like a football. They have a nipple at the end of them, and they're just they're just a great joy. Uh, I've only seen them once. That was up in Wisconsin, but we do definitely have them here in Missouri. I just haven't seen them with their sporophytes here. Then the picture on the right, I have an arrow pointing to a capsule buried within the leaf. So sometimes you have to look hard for those capsules. They can really be buried in the leaf. And this is Tortula alkalon. Sometimes the setas are different colors and that can help you with diagnostic characteristics in the field. This is Ditricum pallidum, which goes by the common name of golden thread boss. And I think you can see why. There is another species in Missouri, though not nearly as common, that will have red seta. So again, sometimes these features can help you determine what species or even genus you may be looking at. So capsules can come in various shapes and si uh, forms. They can also sit differently at the end of the seta. So this is Funaria hygrometrica. This is beautiful to see when the capsules are mature because they will be this vibrant red, sometimes a deep purple color. And the capsules here are what we call piriform. They're pear-shaped. And some of them are kind of horizontal uh, off the edge of the stem or seta. Some of them are pendant, meaning they're swooping down. So these are all kind of characteristics to look for uh, in a sporophyte as far as the arrangement and the style and the look of the capsules. Uh, this is showing you Bartramia palmiformis. This goes by the common name of apple moss. You probably can see why, because when that capsule is young and maturing, it's apple green and round, so therefore it looks like an apple. If you catch it at the right time and look at it at the right angle, the picture on the left is showing you what I call Halloween googly eyes uh, because they look like a pair of eyeballs staring back at you. Lots of fun. But when they age and mature, uh, they'll become brown and get these uh, grooves in them. So sometimes the sporophytes will change or the capsules will change characteristics as they age. Some of our capsules are angled. So the bottom inset picture is showing you Polytrichum juniperinum with angles to it. They're cubic, rectangular. Uh, that can help you determine what species you're looking at. The picture in the background is showing you the same species, but it's showing you that calyptra. So remember, that's a covering that's covering the capsule while it's maturing. And in this case, it's hairy. So we can have hairy calyptras. In fact, the genus name implies that poly means many, trichum means hair. So there are many hairs on this calyptra. And indeed, there are. This is my last uh, photo sh slide to share with you for sporophytes. This is Plagionium cuspidatum. This is just showing you a very 
pendant hanging uh, capsule. Sometimes we call these um, goose mosses, gooseneck mosses or swan mosses because you get all of these sporophytes hanging out there and it just looks like a mass of, of geese sitting on this rock. Uh, it's also showing you a um, cylindric shaped capsule and there is actually a calyptra on there. It's very hard to see because this is a quite differently shaped uh, calyptra compared to the last one that you just saw. So calyptras come in a lot of different, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but quite a few different styles too, but we're just, we just don't have time to get into those. So that wraps it up for my diversity and the characteristics of mosses. Uh, the other part that I was going to or am going to talk to you about tonight are the potential roles of mosses in Missouri uh, prairies. I do need to set a few parameters to make this easier to discuss. And the first is what prairie systems are we talking about? You all probably know better than I do about the prairie systems in Missouri, but we do know we have tall grass prairies. That's our probably our dominant. We also have wet prairies and we have sand prairies. And then I'm sure there are variations thereof, depending on soil types, stuff, 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 that sort of thing. So for this program, I'm going to focus on the tall grass prairies because that's what we predominantly uh, have in this state. The other parameter that we have to set is specifically what mosses are we talking about in that prairie? Because prairie systems, like any other ecosystem out there, will have microhabitats within it. So a tall grass prairie is going to have a riparian zone running through it. Uh, you could come across an area where it has exposed bedrock. So you have this glade system within the prairie. Uh, you can also come across just a small grove of trees or bushes. So you have a miniature woodland in your prairie. So this talk, we are going to focus on mosses that are on soil, that are devoid of any uh, moisture except what they acquire through the atmosphere and that they do not get any shade from anything other than the vascular uh, plants around them, the, the grasses and the forbs. So basically, we'll be talking about corticulous species of moss, mosses that grow on the soil. So with that in mind, I think it's easiest to look at what roles moss uh, have when it comes to uh, the soil systems. So I'm going to first talk just briefly about that role and then offer a suggestion as to what I think, how big of a role that plays in our tall grass prairie system. So the first step is carbon sequestering and nitrogen fixing. So with carbon sequestering, the latest research shows that moss can sequester up to 6.43 billion metric tons a year. And that is impressive. The the ecosystem that plays the largest role in this would be our peatlands, which make up about 3% of our total land mass. So we need to really protect those. And those are comprised mostly of sphagnum mosses. So all of our bogs are playing a huge, huge role in carbon sequestering. So how big of a role do our mosses in a tall grass prairie um, Play, and I'm going to say that it's fairly minimal. And that's only because the mosses make up a minute amount of the biomass in that prairie system. So your grasses and your for forbs are sequestering more carbon than what the, the moss are doing in that healthy and intact system. So nitrogen fixing. Typically, when they look at nitrogen fixing as a whole on a global scale, they'll look at biocrust. So this particular paper that I looked up, they lumped algae, moss, and lichen together, and they found that they postulated that they, they fix up to 50 million tons of nitrogen a year, and that represents roughly half of the naturally fixed nitrogen uh, that we can find. So again, how much of a role do the mosses play in an intact and healthy prairie system? I'm going to say minimal, same thing. It's just mosses are such a small percentage of the overall biomass that, that's going on uh, in that prairie system. Soil generation. All right, so if we were talking about moss on rocks, this would be stellar because Moss do actually break down rocks over time and help contribute to that mineral, creating that mineral soil. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about moss on soil, but they still contribute to the health of that soil system. They will add in organic components to the existing soil system. So moss obtain the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen from the air around them, uh, mostly. And then when they die, that pa they pass that on to the soil. So they enrich uh, the soil that is uh, beneath them. 
All right, so how big of a role does this play in our tall grass prairie system that's healthy and intact? Ooh, probably minimal. Um, again, it's a it's a equation, or it's a just pure amount of, of moss that's found in that system. All right, one last role that we're gonna look at is protection. Moss offer protection to soil in a couple of different ways. They can do it through temperature control, moisture control, and erosion control. So basically for te temperature and moisture control, it's just this, this film, think of it as insulation over the soil, pre uh, protecting it from the harsh environment above. And that's wonderful news because that really helps the whole microbiome that's found in the soil beneath it that we are just beginning to stretch or scratch the surface of understanding all the interactions that go on there but the bacteria the microbes the the microbial fungal associations all that kind of stuff it's giving them a chance to do what they need to do and not get fried or not get washed away or any of those things so it offers protection layer to them additionally moss can help a little bit with the erosion control obviously if you get a flash flood come through your area they don't stand a chance they will be wiped away but they do in a regular rainfall and a fairly level surface will help dissipate the energy from the, the raindrops. And again, you don't have raindrops falling on exposed soil, splashing soil away or uh, allowing any of it to run off. So they do help with erosion control. So how much of a role does this play in our intact, healthy, tall grass prairie systems? Yeah, minimal. So, but okay, I know you're wanting to throw some rotten tomatoes at me right now because you want to hear something spectacular. Uh, you're expecting me to say how phenomenal mass mosses are in the tall grass prairie systems and all that kind of stuff. And right now I'm just telling you the role is pretty minimal, but bear with me. As we know, nature is rarely ever static and tall, tall grass prairie systems are not immune to that. Nature likes to throw curveballs. So tornadoes, they'll come flying through, they'll wipe off that layer of, of wonderful uh, grasses and forbs, they'll even wipe away a certain amount of, of topsoil and just leave just bare destruction behind them. Fires, fires can be either relatively polite and just burn the top thatch layer, or they can pretty be pretty hot and intense and really uh, do some damage to the soil and the biome underneath. So fires can be a form of damage in the system. And then Bison, as an example, uh, they like to wallow in the mud. I mean, who doesn't on a hot day? It's a lot of fun. I don't know. I've never done it. Maybe I should try. But they certainly will. That just turns everything up. And so they're another form of uh, harm to the system. So this is where moss do excel or can excel. They are our healers, they're our doctors, they are emergency responders to our damaged systems. Uh, we have several species that will come in and just commandeer bare soil and start to cover it. So all those things I just talked about previously as far as protection and things of that nature become extremely important because that moss will keep that uh, soil from washing away. It will uh, offer that buffer protection against the extreme elements so that the, the soil underneath, those microbes, the fungi, all that stuff can start to heal and regenerate. And then over time, and even add nutrients then back into the soil if you had a lot of that wash away or blow away in a tornado. So it is definitely adding to a healing process until the rest of the vascular plants can start to move in and take over and the system can completely heal. This is a picture of Funaria hygrometrica. This is common in like campfire uh, burn rings. Uh, this is a picture taken in a uh, area where we had to burn a lot of downed wood. So I can tell you that the soil is extremely sterilized. Uh, this is year two. I'm monitoring this just to see how everything plays out uh, as, the, as the soil uh, heals over time. So this is year two that I'm starting to get a good covering now of uh, moss over the soil. Nothing else is growing in there. Just it's a tough, tough uh, environment, harsh environment in there with all the ash and everything else going on. This is a picture showing Tortula alkaline on what was a bare uh, section of soil. And you may say, hey, it looks like cute little puffballs of moss. And no, it's really not. It's moss just growing on mounds of soil. And the reason there are mounds of soil there is because this is a perfect example of how it protects the soil. So the areas that did not have that moss grow on it, 
the rain beating down on it flattened, smooshed the soil. Some of it ran away, um, or not ran away, washed away. And so this shows you a very clear effect of how that moss can protect the soil. They've done a lot of research into uh, comparing the soil underneath a moss layer compared to exposed soil. And there's, there's no doubt that the soil underneath that moss is significantly healthier than the bare and exposed soil. So the last slide that I have to share with you is Wysia controversa. You'll notice that it's covered in a lot of sporophytes. And so several of these species are monoecious. They reproduce really well, which is important and helpful if you need to cover an area quickly. So moss, as far as how I, I, I would say, their biggest role that they have in a prairie, tall grass prairie system is they're the healers. So when damage occurs, they are gonna go in and start to help that system recover. And that is an extremely important part of any restoration projects, whether it's you know because of natural occurrences or we're trying to go in and heal some land. So moss are, are great friends to have to help us heal these systems. So on that note, I wanna wish everybody a happy Halloween and I'm gonna end it on a slide showing you uh, Pseudo triquetrum, uh, no, wrong one, uh, Rytidia delphus triquetris. Yes, these names get very challenging after a while, but its common name is electrified cattail and I think you can see why. So thank you very much for joining in tonight and I will go ahead and turn this over to Lily. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Lori. Electrified cat tail. That is yeah. incredible. <laughs> I love that common name. And yeah, whenever you're dealing with the scientific ones all the time, it's nice to get such an exciting <laughs> one in there. So thank you. Yes. Awesome. I'm sort of arranging the Q&A questions that um, we've been shared with. So if you have more, just put them in the Q&A and I'll do my best to pass them along. Um, we have both some specific questions about mosses and some larger, maybe more discussion points. So I'll try and get the specific ones out of the way first. So um, there was a question about the red stems of the mosses that you showed. Is that because of a you know, a presence of a pigment or maybe we are familiar as we look at the leaves that are changing now, it's the chlorophyll going away and revealing this other pigment. So can you just speak to that coloring a little bit more? Sure. It's definitely a pigment. And I think they're very similar to what we see in the leaves as far as the species that have red stems typically have red stems from the get-go or as the age. So is that in a you know, response to the environment? I'm not 100% sure. Definitely when the leaves uh, start to change red, that typically is a response to the environment, but they're definitely a pigment uh, because of a pigment being produced. Mm. Got it, yeah. That high sunlight sort of thing that maybe we've, or we're familiar with. Um, another specific question was, I think it was the tomentum or the sort of the rooting, type cells of mosses. Um, we had questions on, do these gather nutrients or do anything besides sort of grappling or speak to, if you could speak to their role a little more. Sure. So predominantly it is to anchor them, but they do help in the aid of nutrient flow. Uh, mostly in my understanding is it's through capillary action. So it will help pull wick uh, moisture droplets around them. So if those, mo those moisture droplets have nutrients in them, of course, that's a way of wicking those up into the rest to the rest of the plant where then the cells and the leaves and the stem can absorb it. So they do aid uh, to a certain amount in obtaining nutrients and water. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. The sort of physical structure of the plant. Um, we had other questions on um, sort of the colonization of mosses on bare soil, the last sort of topic that you were sharing. Um, there's, yeah, this catastrophic event so that soil is bare. How do the mosses get there then? Are they, is it something that's remaining in the soil or is it colonization? What does that look like for mosses? All very good questions. Um, I, I can't give you a uh, scientific answer on that. I can speculate. Uh, I, I would believe that cert, some of those species there's definitely soils re, uh, soil spores remaining in the soil. And it could just also be that 
any bear, if you've walked through a, par a prairie, you are going to come across patches that are bare. That's not necessarily damaged per se. It's just, it's the way it is. And so you will have moss already in the prairie. So they're, they're definitely in the prairie. And so it's just, I, I would say it's convenience, you know, all of a sudden you have a big, huge bare spot and they're like, Hey, we can grow. Yeah, absolutely. And we also had questions on um, if you wanted to cultivate moss in on purpose or, you know, maybe in your yard, it's, you know, could be nice under plants. How can we do this ethically? How, what is the, do you have any guidance for our listeners on that? <laughs> oh, and that's a, that's a big field that's generating a lot of interest. Um, I'm glad you mentioned ethically because there's definitely a point uh, ethics needs to be taken into consideration. We have species that grow like weeds. We also have species that don't grow like weeds and we have S1 rank species. So I would encourage people to, to learn what those species are. First of all, know what you're looking at. Just don't assume because you see it, or even if you see a lot of it in that location, doesn't mean that it's everywhere. You could have just hit the jackpot of where you find a lot of it. So you definitely need to... <clears throat> learn about your species that you're looking at so that you can ethically collect. And as far as uh, mosses are going, they're really no different than our vascular plants. We have some that are generalists. They'll grow on anything in any kind of environment. So if you transplant them, they're probably going to be fine. But we do have species that are very select. Uh, they may only grow on sandstone rock. They may only grow on calcium laden soil. So that's another area where you have to know um, what you're collecting. It, will it survive and what you're going to put it in? So uh, you have to take that into consideration too. Um, beyond that, I don't have good resources to share. Uh, like I said, I know that's becoming popular and people want to have moss gardens and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I'd have to look into that to see if anybody's uh, done any good books that are actually, you know, scientifically correct um, to help people with that. Definitely. Yeah. And if we can find any resources, um, this also goes along. Folks are looking for information on guides and things. We will be passing you like a really great email tomorrow with tons of great resources that Lori has passed on to us. Um, so be just wait a few more hours for these great you know, keys and user-friendly guides for mosses in the field. Um, a question, so yeah, we've been using S1, S2, and just wanted to clarify for folks that this is referencing this list called, you know, it's for the species of conservation concern in Missouri. S2 is, means, you know, imperiled or, you know, so it's very, rare s1 is the most rare it goes to five um so when we're talking if we're talking about s2s it's really something that yeah it would be a real shame to disturb so just to um, clarify that to people but i was hoping that you could speak to endangered mosses and maybe why some are so endangered and microhabitats and dispersion and all of that you can speak however you'd like to it <laughs> sure um <clears throat> So the species of conservation concern list takes into a lot of factors, you know, that the the first species that I talked to, uh, I talked about Dicranium polycetum, it's S1. And like I said, it's only S1, not because of any anything humans are doing or anything of that nature. It's just because we're on the edge of its range. So it's just not very common for those reasons. Uh, that being said, there are species that are S1 ranked uh, because the habitat is limited. So these very small chasms to find it in, it's just, it's very limited. We have um, a beautiful moss here in Missouri. It's called sword moss. Um, it's only from a, a two locations, I believe, maybe three locations. And it just, it, it, it needs a very specific area to grow in or, and there, yeah. So it's, it's particular about that. As far as other species being on that list could very well be because of human induced causes. Um, I'm, I haven't explored uh, our moss species here in Missouri to be able to say if we have any of those. I honestly do not know. I just haven't looked uh, from that avenue. But I do know that there are species out there that are already, you know, limited in their area, but then human encroachment or changes in the environment around it are definitely causing issues. Definitely. Yeah, we find that with 
our some of our prairie plants too is that you know we might be just right on their edge or maybe they used to be common or where you are they you know in the right spot they are common so yeah it's a broad term that can mean many different things um and so now i have a couple questions about beginning to be interested in mosses and sort of you know if you could speak to what do you need anything to start to be interested in mosses and if you do what do you do and maybe a little bit further is how can we get how can the public get access to microscopes or you know do you have any oh. tips or tricks on that like if you're ready to you were dangling those carrots and they were beautiful yeah, I know. <laughs> but if you don't have a microscope or you know what can we do about that too right uh, so getting in, getting into bryophytes, uh, so if I may put a plug in, I am writing a field guide to the mosses in Missouri. And the reason I am doing that is because this is the book that I wished that I had when I first started getting into mosses, because it was very daunting. I mean, my choices were basically go big or go home. And it's, it's, that's tough. You get into really serious technical keys, <laughs> and, but there are definitely a number of mosses that we can identify out in the field, if mostly just two show the variation. Part of the problem was I didn't even know what mosses we had. When you don't know what you don't know, it's hard to know what you need to know. Mm -hmm. And so just, just knowing the variation that was out there, like that's a moss. I had no idea. So getting more field guide books out will be extremely helpful. I think to, to give people some guidelines and a knowledge base to just to even know where to start looking or what they're looking at is in fact a moss. So that's the first one. So it can be done, but in that email, I also provide some online resources too that people can get on uh, to start to see uh, what some of these look like and maybe go take a picture and post it um, or, or not, not even post it, but just compare it to some of these online sites to see what they're looking at. Uh, but you can get into it really the big, I would encourage everybody to get, <clears throat> I do like the 20X hand lenses that have a light on them. Uh, that makes it extremely helpful. You can get them on Amazon for $10, $20. So they're not crazy expensive anymore. As far as the microscopes go, gosh, that's a really good question too. I do not know uh, avenues to get hands on microscopes easily. Maybe somebody in the audience does and can type that in. I'm just not aware of it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wish I could give a better, uh, more help on that one. But no, yeah, it's good to. My biggest thing is, is, is it can be done and, and you can actually go out and enjoy this little world and, and learn some things and learn about it. And I just encourage people not to be daunted <laughs> by it all. It is possible. I do not have a botany background whatsoever, and this is all self-taught. And so it is possible. And uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of fun. No, I, I can feel that from you. It Yeah, it's got me excited about mosses. So yeah, I love that. <laughs> Of that you don't need this these gear pieces that maybe are hard to get but you know if you go further you'll find that you might need it or you know so maybe there'll be like library cards for microscopes one day <laughs> um yeah, that'd be great. i have one more question um that maybe i should have linked in with the mosses colonizing different soil and how they're the healers of the prairie in these systems um can you speak to more different, um, maybe acidic or alkaline soil types. You know, we find mosses in glades and in forests. And so can you just speak to that a little bit? Yes, we definitely have acidophiles. We definitely have calcifiles and we have ones that really don't care. So we definitely have that variation in the moss world. Um, I think, uh, the species that will colonize the soil in these types of situations tend to be, again, they don't care. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there might be, and there might be, uh, I just haven't delved into it that hard, but Ysia will, will grow on just about anything. Um, Tortula acolon, I think is pretty, uh, am, uh, pretty easy uh, to grow on stuff. And then Funaria, I mean, gosh, if it grows in ash, I think it can tolerate a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's a pretty hardy little moss. But we certainly do have uh, mosses that have specific needs or specific requirements or can't tolerate certain uh, environments, while others are a lot more amicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking recently about 
mosses on the prairie and yeah if they're out in like you were saying only getting water from the air and only getting shade from the grasses that it seems really hard for a little a little green thing that can not doesn't have the sort of deep prairie root system that we're thinking about what do those adaptations what are those adaptations or you know how does that make that moss successful is it that they're they can store water within them or that they're okay with not getting water or you know what is can you tell me about that <laughs> Yeah, so mosses uh, are brilliant at um, being able to handle desiccation. I mean, they're just phenomenal about that. And certain species are more adapted to it. So if you go in a glade system or a, um, a desert system, those mosses are the kings of it. I mean, they're they're just and and some of it I think is just the genetics and and I'm getting past my point of understanding of them or knowing that involved level but some of it certainly is um, physical characteristics that they have uh, those lamellae that I was showing you they can help trap and hold water um, the sphagnum the leucobrium have those specific cell structures uh, the papillae reflects sunlight reflects sunlight differently so it's believed that that can help. Uh, those species ward off desiccation uh, quicker. But then I do believe that mosses have the capability to produce whatever chemicals they need in order to handle that, that desiccation period of time. Um, in our herbarium, you can pull out moss samples from 50, 60 years ago and and they're just, they're brilliant. Uh, they may be lacking chlorophyll in, at some points, but they, they retain their structures uh, very well. So they are definitely hardy little things through all their sorts of ways of combating, you know, drying out too quickly and uh, trying to survive. So they, they do survive on very little. Tough little <laughs> survivors. Yeah, <laughs> they are. awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I will end or, you know, we'll wrap with one last question that like, you know, there are a couple of people just curious about how you started or, you know, what hooked you. And if you could say in that we had one specific question on like, you know, when you're looking at mosses, should we not touch them? Or, you know, what should we tell, especially kids that are learning to interact with mosses? What should we strive for in looking at them? <laughs> Yeah, and um, I'll start off with the latter question first. Um, absolutely, they should touch them and feel them because they're fun and they're they're they feel some of them feel differently compared to other ones. Some are really soft. Some are maybe a little more. I don't want to use the word spiky, but spiky. So touch is a very important uh, receptor that we have, um, sensitive function, whatever you want to call it, that we do have. You're not going to hurt the moss if you're concerned about that, unless you have some nasty chemical on your hand for some reason i don't know why you would and then touch it but in general your your oils and your skin and things like that are not going to hurt the moss so just that aspect you won't hurt as far as um removing it from the substrate uh i'll be the i'll be the the karen on that and just encourage people not to do that unless they have a really good reason just because as more people get out in our environment whereas before if it was just one person doing it in a blue moon it was no big deal but now if you get a thousand people out in that same area doing it pretty much you end up wiping away i mean look at the areas of rocks for example where people climb on them all the time they're devoid of moss and lichen and that's just foot traffic so it's the same thing I just encourage you to bend down on the ground and look at it through your lens and, and only actually remove it if you have a, a, a really good reason, you know, identification, because again, some things you can only identify in a microscope. Um, as far as how I got into this, it was a complete accident. Uh, I like lichen. I still do. Uh, it was my first love. And I got to the point where I needed a microscope and I finally got the microscope. It had been a long time since I used one and it came with software. So I thought, oh, I remember mosses are one cell thick. They'll be easy to put underneath the slide. I just need some water. It's all over my yard. I'll go grab that and throw it underneath the micro microscope. So I did. And then what is the next question that anybody with any sort of inquisitive mind about their environment asks? What species is it? 
So I attempted to try to figure that out and realize that this was an amazing world. There is so much into it and so much out there. And I was hooked by the challenge and I fell in that hole really hard. <laughs> I've not found my way out and that's okay because I really enjoy it. So really it was by accident. That's amazing. I love that. You just followed <laughs> this trail <laughs> that was opened in front of you. That's lovely. So thank you so much, Lori. It was a really lovely, engaging, beautiful talk. And we're, yeah, just thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, who is going to share some details with us. <laughs> so thank you, Lori. All right. Thank you, Lily. Okay. Thank you, Lily and Lori. Um, Lily for facilitating the Q&A and Lori for sharing your knowledge and enthusiasm about mosses. As mentioned before, this Absolutely. webinar, oh, yeah. as mentioned before, <laughs> this webinar has been recorded and an email will be sent to all tomorrow with the links and other helpful resources shared. Um, you can register now and plan to join us on Zoom on November 6th for our upcoming uh, MOIP webinar, Common General Use Herbicides and How They Relate to Aquatic Use Sites with Lucas Madison, the Corvetta Land Management Specialist for Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Iowa. Um, MOIP, which stands for Missouri Invasive Plant Council, provides information and resources aimed towards making early detection and control of known and potential invasive plants a statewide priority, and operates with funding by the Missouri Prairie Foundation's Grow Native program. The, this webinar and more can be registered for at our website under the events tab. And while this concludes today's broadcast, um, we're so grateful that we were able to share time with Lori, and uh, we appreciate so much her enthusiasm with the last slide with the electric cattail moss. And I want to thank all of you today um, for joining us, and I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.